Welcome to the Rose Show podcast. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm your host, Rosanna, and I'm here today with Nancy Davis, founder and CIO of Quadratic Capital, Innovative Asset Management. Nancy is also a portfolio manager for two ETFs on the New York Stock Exchange. She is also part of the 100 most influential women in finance and many other awards, such as Rising Star. Nancy, you are truly a woman leader in business and finance and an inspiration to all. It's amazing. I'm truly honored to be here with you today. Thank you so much for coming. So how are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for for having me on your as your guest. It's really exciting, and you're you're you've been so supportive of me, and I'm I'm so grateful to be here. So thank you so much. Now let's begin with you telling us a little bit about yourself. Um, so I'm uh, the founder of Quadratic. I've been working uh, for my own firm. Um, living the American dream for about a decade now. So it's really exciting to, um, you know, start a firm, run a company, try to better client outcomes. Um, prior to starting my own firm, I spent about 10 years at Goldman Sachs. I was very, very fortunate to spend most of my time in the proprietary group where I was the uh, head of credit derivatives and OTC trading for what that means is just Goldman's capital. We had no clients. Uh, it was just Goldman's own money that we were investing, but it was a great environment, a great place to learn and uh, really helped me with uh, learning about um, this industry and also giving me a very entrepreneurial kind of roots and, and base. Thank you. You definitely are an entrepreneur, founder. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and I know that in the field of finance, as well as being an executive officer, it's clearly a male majority field. What are the challenges you may have faced, if any? Well, definitely, I think we all face challenges. I think for me personally, the biggest one was balancing being a mother and also being uh, in the industry and having, you know, kind of an all encompassing work ethic. I would say, I think it was more of a me problem than the field. Um, so that was probably one of my personal challenges. But I also, I feel like in investing and in portfolio management or trading, whatever you want to call it, investing generally, I think it's a really great opportunity for women too, because it is such a meritocracy because you have, you know, your performance, you have a number next to your name. So I feel like I also feel so grateful to have found this industry to have the opportunities that I did. And I I think you can always be like, oh, it's really hard and everybody faces challenges, but I also see tremendous opportunities that I, you know, I had and I'm I'm grateful for the people, the firms, the the clients, you know, you just have to be very, very humble and very grateful for for the doors that are open. Not every door gets open, but for the ones that we do, you just have to be so appreciative. Thank you. A perfect answer. <laughs> Couldn't ask for anything better. I was going to actually say you're actually very humble. Uh, your accomplishments are amazing and an inspiration. And thank you so much for all you do. You are truly an asset to the financial community. Mm -hmm. I want to begin with <laughs> I want to begin with your two funds that you have on the New York Stock Exchange. First, quadratic interest rate volatility. I-V-O-L. Now, everyone, you have to go to their website, Quadratic Capital, and you have to see the little animation. Uh, there's a little guy in a boat, and it is so symbolic of volatility because he's trying to ride the rocky waves. And um, very creative, I have to say, Nancy. I love it. Could you tell us about that fun in particular first, please? Sure. So. Um... When I started my career at Goldman Sachs, it was, I hate to date myself, but it was in the late 90s. And it was right when the US Treasury invented the inflation protected bond markets. And so I think that's one thing people always look at what happened in the 70s during the last period of high inflation. And I like to remind people like, 
the interest rate markets, the derivative markets didn't exist. The swap market really started in the late 80s. And then the inflation protected bond market didn't start in the US until 97. And early in my career, I remember thinking like, wow, this makes no sense that people would use one index to measure inflation. It's the TIPS, which are the Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, get reset with CPI. And CPI is just one index, right? You would never go buy the Dow Jones index or the S&P or the NASDAQ or the Russell and say, ta-da, I have the um, equity market. And so it always kind of struck me as like, that doesn't make any sense to use one index to calculate inflation, especially even the Fed doesn't use CPI. They have all these other indicators and a third of CPI is rent. So I think for me, creating this, you know, our, our eyeball ETF, it was really a solution that I saw to tips being only reset with CPI and also being bonds, right? The, the problem with any bond is all bonds, even even bonds that you know are short duration, they're still, it's not really short anything, it's just less long. So they're still all long duration, which what, what that means is when interest rates go higher, bonds lose money in price terms. And so I was like, this could be a really great solution to help investors. And I don't think people really know the problems that exist with tips by themselves because we really haven't had a high period of inflation since 97 with the exception of you know right now this this point in time wow well uh sounds like a disruptor to me and you're <laughs> truly an entrepreneur and i mean part of being an entrepreneur is being a problem solver you see inefficiencies in the world and you try to make it better and uh, this sounds like a, a solution for those issues that you saw. Thank you. Um, you know, in challenges, we always find opportunities. There are always opportunities to be found. And it seems that you did. So very interesting on the I bowl. Now, the other ETF. Yes, you have two ETFs, <laughs> not just one. Um, the quadratic deflation ETF. Now, the word deflation, inflation is a very popular term these days. Mm -hmm. uh, your ETF is BNDD. And before you begin telling us about that one, I just want to say the hot air balloon <laughs> is very soothing on your website. I love it. You have amazing animations. So very cool stuff. Please tell us about BNDD. Well, so that that fund was really driven by client demand. So we had um, some clients that were coming to us to say, look, you know, we're very concerned that the U.S. is going to become Japan and the demographics and the amount of debt. And there's no escaping this debt bubble. And uh, I think the one the one thing I always try to explain to people is that a lot of fixed income funds use derivatives and derivatives have a pretty bad reputation for you know a pretty good reason because most most derivatives are linear derivatives which what i mean by that is they go up a dollar but they also can go down a dollar and a lot of people since the financial crisis have been using leverage whether oh. it's futures or swaps to gain access to government bond markets because we've been in this you know, with the exception of, you know, recently we've been in a very low yield environment since the QE kind of started mm -hmm. and the GFC. So that fund, what it does is it, it adds a positive convexity um, payout with the use of options on top of the treasury portfolio. And so um, I think it's a, it's using fully funded options. Both of our funds use fully funded options. So it's a type of derivative, but it's a kind that, you know, when you buy an option, there's never a funding obligation above what you pay. So I think of it more as like, you know, a simple example would be like a debit card, you know, where you go and you, you actually pay for it and you not borrowing money. Whereas if you use futures or swaps, you're essentially, you know, it's almost like credit card risk where you're, you pay a little bit and you get a lot more exposure than what you actually buy. And you're subject to, you know, variation margin, whether it's from the exchange or from your counterparty at any point, and that can create funding obligations. Um, and that's kind of what we recently saw with the UK, I guess, 
anyone mm -hmm. can have a funding obligation, even a public pension fund. So mm -hmm. it's um, it was pretty timely to launch that right before the UK situation happened. Um, it's a much smaller fund, it's newer, but I do think for people who are concerned that, you know, there's no way out, um, it could be, it could be something worth, you know, asking your financial advisor about. Absolutely. Um, I actually was on bar chart, um, it's a site I use for screeners and I was looking at dividends and <laughs> that one came up as one of the top dividends for ETFs. <laughs> Uh, the BNDD. So definitely something to watch and be, I'm very interested in it myself. Uh, <laughs> so thank you so much for explaining that, Nancy. And now I read under on your website and some wonderful wording regarding both of these ETFs. And I'd like to know if you could please explain it to us regular people. Um, it says quadratics portfolios are structured with convexity to provide asymmetric upside, while the option downside is limited to the option premium. Is that what you just explained to us? Yes, that's perfect connection, Rosanna. It's exactly what we're saying. So we do own treasuries in both ETFs. Both ETFs are majority treasuries. Um, over 80% of both funds, whether they're inflation protected treasuries or regular treasuries. So the treasuries have no defined downside. They're just bonds. So they can you know, they don't have downside, but the options that we use inside, we buy the options. So it's a long only strategy. We're always long only options. And with those, when you buy an option, you can't lose more than what you pay for the option. And the options also get marked to market every day. So, you know, if you, if you have marked to market, like say there's a gain in the option and you buy one of the funds today, that, um, that exposure is marked every day. So it's okay. um, it's a, I think a lot of people don't realize that they have a lot of short convexity in their mm -hmm. bond portfolio. And that's kind of been one of my, you know, missions in life is to really help educate and explain to people um, certain, you know, the fixed income markets are pretty complicated. Um, there's a lot of jargon terminology out there. And I, I try to help people explain and, and understand, especially because we've had, you know, many, many years of quantitative easing and bond buying, and that has dampened volatility in the fixed income markets. And so what we saw last year was a pickup in fixed income volatility, because now the Fed is, um, you know, not bond buying, <laughs> they're actually uh, trying to allow some of their balance sheet to roll off with quantitative tightening. Mm -hmm. So it's exactly. pretty timely for people to be aware that, um, you know, essentially any place that you have a U.S. mortgage inside your portfolio, that is a short volatility instrument because, you know, if you think about it, if you're a homeowner, um, you were long the option to prepay and the owner of that financial mortgage is short the option to you. <laughs> and so it's sometimes called prepayment risk or negative convexity, but essentially most, most bond investors do have a large allocation to mortgages. Um, you know, the Barclays, oh, well, now it's called the Bloomberg Ag. It used to be the Lehman Ag, and mm -hmm. now then the Barclays Ag, now it's Bloomberg Ag, but it's just an old index and it doesn't have any inflation protection in it, like zero, zero mm -hmm. inflation protected bonds. And then about a third of it is short volatility from the mortgages. Wow. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Um, amazing stuff. Thank you so much for explaining that. I think it would be a nice segue now to go right into the macroeconomics, which is so important and central to all, hence the reason why you created these ETFs uh, and as such a timely time period right right now when we need it the most um you know and plus i think we both enjoy speaking about it i find it fun i think you find it economics interesting right yeah definitely i'd love oh. markets love it abilities it's all all good it's so much fun yeah oh, probabilities yeah. i love it. i love the math it's it's exciting um so let's go right into the fed we have the fomc next week on february 1st the decision's coming Rate hikes most likely incoming. I think 25 basis points is probability of like 99 or something like that. 
Mm -hmm. and um, inflation. So I believe core inflation is very sticky and it's still rising, especially with services and wages. And it's cumulative. Many people don't think of it like that. Um, and I personally doubt we get back to the area that the Fed wants this, this year or anytime soon. Um, but it seems the market thinks we do. Mm -hmm. uh, we have had deceleration and some deflation, mostly from energy and used cars and so forth. Um, what are your thoughts regarding all of that? Inflation, Fed, rate hikes, please, thank you. Yeah, no, it's a great question and, and really timely. I think, you know, definitely um, the all markets are forward looking. So whether it's the stock market that you're talking about or the inflation markets, it's all what's expected in the future. And I think the one thing that that is very peculiar is that everybody, the consensus in the bond markets is that inflation has peaked um, and that's priced in to future inflation expectations. So you can look at a lot of different measures very easily, something called the break-even market, which is, you know, it's just tips versus nominal treasuries, but that will show you the level where CPI needs to be to break even, meaning to make, have it be a better outcome to own inflation protected bonds versus regular bonds and things like the, the five-year, five-year, um, everything is right around 2%, which is um, pretty amazing when you think about you know, the last CPI print was lower, but it's still six and a half percent was the last print. So even if the next one, like say we get to four even or three, the market in the future is priced all pretty much around 2%. So I think it's a unique time for investors to say, look, what if, what if the Fed hiking policy rates is going to hurt the demand side, but maybe it's not going to fix the labor market or fix the supply side issues or fix sort of other things. So I do think inflation expectations in the future are really cheaply priced because the consensus is, is that the Fed hiking policy rates is going to kill inflation mm -hmm. and it's already been priced in. Yes, perfectly said. Thank you. So it seems that we have rate hikes incoming probably the next two months and maybe a pause is in store for us at some time, maybe May or June. Do you believe we could have a cut later this year? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely something that the market is expecting rate hikes and then rate cuts are being priced in. So I think um, it it's, I don't know, obviously it's hard to say with a crystal ball what policymakers are going to do. I think, you know, 2022 is a great year for, you know, most, um, let's just say Wall Street people were expecting three hikes in 22. And we ended up getting, you know, way more than that, mm -hmm. um, 425 basis points between March and December. So it's more like, was that closer to 17? <laughs> so it was, um, you know, assuming 25 a hike, it definitely was um, very unexpected, and I think I think it's really hard to know what policymakers are going to do. But I do think you can look at markets and see where opportunities are on the investing side. And I think it's just super important to be diversified. and And my personal philosophy is that I think people should have some allocation to inflation protection, just because it's not in these common indices like the ag. And I do think, you know, we live in a real world and especially, you know, as you get closer to retirement, you're not going to be benefiting from any wage inflation. Like think about if you're retired, you don't have a job. And so if, if there is inflation, it's just, you have a higher cost of living, a higher cost of prescription drugs, food, energy, all those things. So I kind of feel like everybody in our real life is actually short inflation because we live in a real world. And if you don't have inflation in your portfolio, you're sort of missing out on, you know, I feel like everybody right now is making it a trade about is inflation falling? Is it going higher? <laughs> What's it going to do? And to me, I think it should be just part of a diversified portfolio is having some allocation just in case 
the Fed hiking rates doesn't work. You know, what if, you know, we had more QE purchases in the eight weeks uh, following the COVID outbreak in March 2020 than we did in the previous nine years of QE. So um, it's a little bit of, you know, kind of experimental monetary policy side and sort of, you know, increasing the balance sheet so much, having so much QE. Now we have QT. We've had a huge, uh, very, very fast, probably late rate hiking cycle. And I think there's a lot of debate about where where the where rates will be. But to me, it's all about what's priced in and and protecting, you know, no matter what industry you're in, you know, whether you're in a teacher, you know, a waitress, a doctor, um, you know, a finance professional. I feel like all of us have, you know, our work and we have our life savings and you just want to make sure that you have the purchasing power and you don't outlive your wealth, you know, I think at the end of the day. And that's the whole point of portfolio diversification is to not have everything go down together. And I think 2022 is a real wake up call because so many things did become correlated and people lost money on stocks and bonds. And, you know, I think it's just a good opportunity to say, like, really rethink asset allocation and less about whether inflation is a trade or not. I love that. It's real world. This is, we live in a nominal world and <laughs> the data that the, the inflate, we have to look at the real versus the nominal. So yes, like you said, the um, retired population does not benefit from wage inflation. So there are a lot of things they need to look at to diversify. And we will be speaking about diversifying versus various alternative asset classes. And I believe that's what you're referring to instead of just the traditional 60-40 that people always think about. There's a lot else out there, like you mentioned, like in your, your two ETFs, um, that you can have some protection against this inflation if it doesn't come back down like the market seems to assume that it will. Um, I'd like to touch upon the labor market uh, because you did say the word labor market and it's <laughs> all interrelated with these rate hikes and everything that's going on. Powell saying he has the three goals uh, mm -hmm. bringing inflation, clear evidence of inflation to 2% um, below trend growth and to soften the labor market. And I don't think mm -hmm. we're seeing a softening over there. Yeah. What are your thoughts regarding that? And do you think we may see a change this year? I mean, definitely um, the Fed's been very focused on the core piece on services too. Um, I do think we are seeing some, like if you look at the tech industry, there have been a lot of layoffs, a lot of um, kind of weakness. Um, and But it's hard to know whether that's going to be something that continues or not. But I think the thing that that worries me, that kind of freaks me out, especially as we head into the U.S. presidential election, is some, you know, I think all policymakers are very well-meaning, right? Their intentions are to help their constituents and to get reelected. And, you know, I'm not trying to make a political statement, but it does, it does kind of concern me a little bit with certain states sending inflation relief checks in the mail, like that kind of worries me because I'm like, what are the second order impacts of doing mm -hmm. that on the labor market? And so I think it's definitely a really tricky time as we head into the election because inflation, even though future inflation expectations are really cheap, they're really priced very low, realized inflation is very high. And so there's this huge disconnect. It's kind of like, you know, when people talk about volatility markets, they talk about realized versus implied volatility. That just means, you know, what's actually happening versus what's priced in in the future. And I think the same principle implies for inflation markets that realized inflation, you know, whether it's seven or six and a half or five, it's higher than it has been for, for a lot of people for a long time, even though it's priced to dramatically fall in the future. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, so we got our GDP number today. Um, now we're 2.9%. We see a deceleration in real GDP. So we are starting to see maybe you could say slower growth. 
Um, and when we look at the manufacturing indexes, uh, the PMI, the ISM, we do see that there's contraction. And especially new orders has been contracting severely for mm -hmm. quite some time, I think over six months or maybe even more. And um, what are your thoughts regarding all of that? Do you look at manufacturing and the growth and how do, what, what do you see out of what's been going on? Yeah, I think the, the headline number this morning was a positive, but if you peel back the onion, there was a lot of things that were pretty concerning in that report. Um, so the, the fourth quarter was really driven by inventory increases. Um, that was about 50% of Q4's growth. So I don't think that's like a super healthy sign. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I definitely think We'll get the inflation number tomorrow and see how how that data looks. But I just think you can't, you know, go off of one data point or one quarter. I think it's more of the trend. And I'm I'm concerned about a lot of things going into this year. And I'm not, you know, it's it's really tough to be an investor because you want to be long term. You want to, you know, create more wealth from your savings, but. I do think it's uh it's tricky because you can make you can make a case for a stagflationary outcome pretty easily, right? You could say, look, maybe you know growth is going to be slowing because we have had you know liquidity reduced, financial conditions tighten, the Fed hiking rates, um, everything has gotten more expensive. Um, we still have supply side disruptions. We still have a very, very tight labor market, especially with, um, you know, the transportation of goods and services. And, and it's hard to reverse wage inflation, right? It's hard when you give somebody a raise to then say, oh, never mind, you know, um, we'll take it back. So it's pretty sticky. So I think it's just, to me, I think it's all about diversification, no matter what you're doing, just understanding, especially if you have, you um, you know, not all bonds are equal. I try to say, you know, really look under the hood in your fixed income portfolio, because if you, a lot of people right now are very focused on interest rate risk, right? You hear it all the time about people talking about wanting to have short duration, wanting to not take rate risk. But the problem with some of these, um, some of these thoughts is that if they don't take a lot of rate risk, they tend to take a lot of spread risk, whether it's corporate credit or um, mortgage risk or structured credit. Anytime you see these three-letter acronyms and your, you know, look inside your mutual funds and ETFs are great because they're really transparent. So you can always see what the fund owns and what's in the underlying. And so I think it's just really important. Governments, I think, are fine on the short duration side, but a lot of other short duration funds to kind of juice juice the yield, they take a lot of whether it's corporate credit or structured credit. So just something to be aware of. I'm not saying it's bad or good. I'm not trying to give financial advice, but I do think, you know, there's only really kind of two types of bond risk. There's, you know, rate risk and then there's spread risk. Mm -hmm. and so if you don't take a lot of rate risk, you might be adding a lot of other risks into the portfolio. So Thank you so much for making us aware of that. So it's always yeah. important to be aware and to read all the fine print, like you said. Yeah. And um, the spread risk, I agree, is also another one we should be aware of besides the credit risk, um, the interest rate and everything. Um, now, you you uh, touched upon the word stagflation. And I wanted to speak with you regarding your thoughts on you know, the inverted yield curve, we, we've seen it inverted, it's becoming more inverted, and everyone's, you know, it seems like everyone's become an economist lately, and yeah. everyone's talking about, oh, there's no recession that's coming any day now. And we know that after we see an inverted yield curve, it could be nine to 28 months, and a lot can happen between that time period. Mm -hmm. Are you thinking that maybe we could experience stagflation at some point, maybe this year or next from the indicators you're seeing? Um, you know, stagflation was kind of a made up term in the 70s. Uh, 
to describe, you know, low growth and higher prices. So I think people shouldn't rule it out entirely and think it's, you know, just a relic from the 70s because you could see, you know, with the labor market being tight, with a lot of the pandemic related supply side issues still kind of outstanding um, and with such a dramatic hike in policy rates that maybe uh, growth could be lowered, but we could also have high prices. And I think the, the reason to focus on that is just in a stagflationary environment that's traditionally really bad for both stocks and bonds. And so going back to the whole like 60, 40 thing, um, you know, a lot of people rely on bonds performing when the stocks sell off. And that's why my comment earlier about know what you own on your bond portfolio, because if you have, you know, let's take a simple example. If you own, I don't know, Apple stock and Apple bonds um, with that corporate credit risk, you don't really have a lot different, right? You still have that corporate beta. Um, and if that company has, say, higher labor costs or supply side disruptions or, um, you know, that sector has a problem or consumer, you know, sentiment or confidence falls a lot, you could see both the stock and the bonds not perform well um, and correlations increase. And so I think it's just really important to understand that most, like, most investors get additional yield and to get additional return above governments, they add credit spread risk to portfolios. Like if you think about all the different strategies out there, whether it's investment grade, high yield, floating rate notes, levered loans, you know, all that stuff relies on, they want tighter credit spreads, right? They want mm -hmm. credit levels to go tighter and then yields to go lower because they're bonds. So you want the price of the bonds to go up. And so that's why I think it's important just to be thinking about other types of diversifying assets. And I'm not saying, you know, you know, anything crazy. I think you can you can look at markets and just make sure that you have, you know, if you have equities, which most people should have, especially, you know, as part of a diversified portfolio, you don't want to have no equities, but you don't want to also have a ton of corporate risk in your bond portfolio that are the same, the same beta to the equity market. Thank you so much. And what a what a great time period to be discussing this. It seems so appropriate during this time period, because in my opinion, I think we may be in this type of challenging environment for probably a little longer. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is very important for everyone to know that. And, you know, when you mentioned ETFs and funds, I, I'm amazed at how many different types there are. Yeah. Um, I even, I just pulled up the other day and A, an alternative minimum tax free municipal bond ETF. I didn't even know that existed. Yeah. Uh, there's just so many different ETFs out there in all shapes and sizes for so many different uses that um, it is important to look at all of those points that you mentioned. So thank you. Now, I think it's important that we talk about the bond market and what are you seeing with yields and which ones are most important to you to look at, or, or if any, um, for indication of, of what to expect in the market, uh, the equities market? Yeah, I think, um, you know, people very much focus on interest rates and they say that generally interest rates, but it's really, I think the term structure of rates that is kind of when you, when you look at where lenders lend money and the, um, as you mentioned, Rosanna, the yield curve is the most inverted spin. It's even below where it was in the eighties. And that that is, you know, whether it causes a recession or predicts a recession or this time's different, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know a crystal ball, but it's definitely super, super inverted. <laughs> and um, you know, what that means is, you know, if you look at like a, a three-month T bill today, you know, three-month T bill is yielding this is a treasury bond 4.6%. But then if you look at the 10-year Treasury. So you know, think about loaning money to the US government for 10 years instead of three months, you get paid uh 345 today. So you have 462 versus under three and a half. You know, that inversion of the yield curve is not 
it's not normal because in normal times you would expect if you lend money longer um, and you expect, you know, inflation that you would get paid more money to loan money for longer. So it's really not a normal environment. It's um, 2022 as the Fed hiked rates, the yield curve just inverted more and more and more. Um, we could question why that is, but I think it's really important for investors to be focused. It's not just on, you know, one interest rate. There are a lot of different, there's a term structure of interest rates and different interest rates at different points of time. So it's just, it's super important to be aware of that um, and and cognizant of what types of risks are, are in your portfolio. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, now, regarding the tightening, we know that the the Fed right now is reducing its balance sheet. It stopped buying um, the bonds, and now it's letting those roll off. Um, do you think we've experienced the worst yet, or do you think that, in your opinion, there's more to come with this tightening liquidity? Yeah, so the Fed... Um has very slowly started to reduce their balance sheet with these caps. So the caps are in place in the fall, they doubled. Um, but I think it's important to note that once the cap is met, the Fed can still go out to the market and buy more bonds to keep the balance sheet stable after the monthly cap is met. And I think it's really important to know that the Fed's balance sheet, the piece of the balance sheet that was bought in QE, so in the open market, is it's called the SOMA holdings. Um, uh, and that that's over $8 trillion. And about a third of that, that SOMA holdings is mortgages. And so I think it's just super important, especially for investors, like the ag index, about a third of it is also mortgages. So you just have to be very careful about what those implications are and really be thinking long-term and, and understanding the risks. Thank you so much. Risk, risk, yeah. risk. And I love hearing that because uh, unfortunately we had a lot of investors that started trading or I should call them traders in 2020 with being stay, staying at home and there were a lot of new traders. And I don't think it's unfortunate because of that environment we were in with all the free money, um, many didn't think of risk. So let's let's hear it from you. Could you give us advice? Just not, I don't like that word. Could you give us just, just a discussion? Just tell us some ideas you have for risk. What is risk management to you? Yeah, well, I'd say big picture i i really hate the word protection like a lot of people are like oh this protects the portfolio this protects you like i think you have to think about all investing involves risk period if you're going to make an investment you should be prepared to lose money and don't you know don't spend that money that you might need for you know your rent or you know other things like all investing involves risk and so I think you really have to to be aware of that when when you're making investments and then it's a question of trying to create a portfolio that has diversifying risks so it's not all the same stuff that's going back to my point about if you have a lot of bonds with corporate credit spread risk and then a lot of equities you might not be it might be called stocks and bonds but it might not be that diversified um in terms of the the beta sensitivity of that portfolio so i think it's just very important to create a diversified portfolio, make sure that you're comfortable with the risks and every type of investment has risks, um, but just trying to create different types of risks so you have that diversification. Perfect, thank you. So diversification, um, I agree as well. Um, I like to have diversification in my portfolio and I think it's a perfect time for us to segue into the market and I, I think, you know, we could begin discussing this diversification of among the various asset classes. So let's speak a little bit about the different asset classes and how you view them. Um, lately, there's a lot of, well, they, you know, there's been talk for quite some time, I think mid that last year about gold and commodities. 
and they've had a nice run. Mm -hmm. um, and many think they will continue to run through 2023. What are your thoughts on diversification with some gold in the portfolio, maybe some other metals or ag? You've mentioned ag a lot and uh, or maybe even energy. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I know I appreciate the works. And I guess I would break um, the asset classes into kind of five buckets. Um, so obviously you have equities, whether they're indices or single stocks, you have the, the stock markets globally. Um, then you have the credit markets, which is anything with credit spread risk. So that would be everything from floating rate notes to levered loans to investment grade, private credit, anything with a credit spread. Um, then you have the FX markets, which are the foreign exchange markets. So dollar was obviously on a tear last year because you had such divergent central bank policy. You know, had the Fed on one end that was aggressively tightening rates, whereas Japan has still been doing QE. And even though they widened the ban on yield curve control, they've still been dovish. So you had that divergent policy and the ECB was kind of in the middle um, in terms of their tightening. Um, so you have equities, credit, FX, um, then the commodity markets, um, and then finally the rates market. So um, the interest rate interest rate markets being uh, kind of without credit spread. So that's every type of government bond, as well as the swap market, which is the unfunded um, market. So a lot of investors around the world think about if you're a um sovereign, let's just take the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and you're selling bonds in US dollars, when you issue bonds, you don't sit there and say, oh, geez, I hope PAL doesn't hike rates. You immediately turn around and hedge your issuance risk in the swaps market. So it's a really, the swaps market is a huge market. Um, it's interest rate market. So it includes um, all different types of currencies have interest rates linked to those currencies. Um, and so that's why I mean by rates, it's a really big market. It's something that a lot of people don't focus on. That's what our two ETFs access the rates market. But going back to your question about commodities, I think a lot of people look at the commodity market as a way to um, diversify for inflation, right? It's something that worked, uh, Sometimes, not, not, mm -hmm. not all the times, but sometimes uh, in the last period of very high inflation. And I think the challenge that I have, I'm not saying don't have, you know, commodities. I think it's important to be diversified. But I think the problem with putting all your eggs in that basket, especially for inflation, is we had kind of a very specific, you know, oil embargo happening in the 70s that made energy prices um, you know, shoot up quite a bit uh, because of that, you know, specific event. And the thing I always try to remind investors is that the inflation protected bond markets didn't exist back then. <laughs> you know, the, the U.S. Treasury only started the inflation protected bond market in 1997. So it didn't exist in the 80s. Even the swaps market, which is, you know, a huge market, you can only really get data going back to 1988. So um, the those markets didn't exist in the 70s. So I think that's the one thing is you have to think about, you know, all the choices now because a lot of people look at that period and try to say what ha what worked then, and they'll mm -hmm. buy, you know, whether it's um, real estate or certain cyclical equities or commodities, and that's because that was the only thing that you could kind of back test. So I think it's just super important to be aware of some of the interest rate and inflation markets didn't exist back then. And so I think it's much more simple, in my opinion, to look at those markets, interest rates and inflation, <laughs> rather than adding that, you know, you might want the commodity beta, you want might, might want it for diversification. But I know there are, there are a lot of like very diehard gold bugs out there that mm -hmm. it's, it's the only way. Yeah. And, um, you know, we're not on a gold standard anymore. Yes. <laughs> it's, uh, okay. Amazing. You know, yeah. 
just important to not have all your eggs in one basket. I love it. Okay. I have to stop for one second. You are brilliant. Okay. I'm just going <laughs> to tell you. And thank you so much for enlightening us, me included, Aww. and all the listeners. I'm sure majority are, we're not fully aware of all these details, which are so important because, you know, it's the headlines that reach people and they, they hear the comparison to the seventies, which I'm actually more of a fan of. I look at all time periods and various bear market cycles and the forties are real interest to me. I do think the twenties, thirties, and forties do resemble the money supply and everything with the 2010s and twenties. And that's a whole other discussion. Um, but you know, it's important to compare with history. We learn from our history. Um, and so exactly as you said, people look to the 70s and assume right away that gold is the way mm -hmm. and is probably the only way. So thank you so much for enlightening us about the rates market and inflation protected bond market is um, just brilliant. I, I, I love it. And, um, you know, many people talk and but you really do the work. So <laughs> this is this is really great. So I love the five buckets: equities, credit, FX, commodities, and rates. So everyone remember that your five <laughs> asset classes. It's pretty. I'm not amazing. including crypto because I'm not calling oh. them asset class, but I'm sure I'm sure we will get comments in <laughs> YouTube to say where's you know that crypto. The, the, We'll stick that in the FX. Yeah, we'll yeah, put that in the FX. Exactly. <laughs> I was just going to say that. I think that belongs in the FX for now. Absolutely. Now, speaking of FX, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on the dollar? And of course, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's not just a dollar by itself. It's compared to other currencies. So um, we have the euro and I think the yuan that are the two main currencies that were the competitor to the dollar for global. And um, it seems that the dollar is still hanging out in that range. And do you think you that it could go back up to new all time or new near term highs? And, and uh, what do you what is what kind of um, message does the doc, the dollars movement lately tell you? Yeah, I think, um, Obviously, I'm I'm pretty new to joining Twitter, which is where we met, and unfortunately, and um, I know it's been very very popular because the dollar was one of the few things that was working last year. Um, but to me, I think like it's kind of speculative because like you know, for people who at least live in the U.S., we kind of have exposure to the dollar already, so I think it's more more of a trade. But I think whenever you're looking at foreign currencies, it's all about interest rate differentials. And you've had um, divergent central banks um, during last year for the hiking cycle, where the Fed was kind of leading the charge on policy hikes, whereas other central banks like Japan, even though, uh, you know, Japan's having 4% inflation, which is super high for them, Historically, they haven't started to hike rates. They're still buying bonds. They're still doing yield curve control, even though they widen the band. And so I think it's really important to know that if you're going to be uh, involved in the, the foreign currency markets, you're really taking a view about interest rate differentials. And, um, you know, I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what central banks are going to do in the future, especially foreign central banks, but it's definitely been um, one of the few things that did work last year. And so I think there is a lot of um, consensus thinking about, about the dollar right now. But I think you should also take that into the inflation view, because if we had a weakening currency, um, that decreases our purchasing power, right? Um, you know, it's kind of nice for us right now. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. been to Europe, for instance, you know, I, uh, I enjoyed the, uh, the duty-free uh, VAT store in the airport on my way out and everything. I use Clarins um, for my, uh, my skincare and everything was so wow. cheap. Because I love Clarins. <laughs> so I was like, bye. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, you know, came back with 
my suitcase, you know, exploding from all the, <laughs> the, the, the cleansers and moisturizers I love, but that's because the dollar has been really strong, but that can easily reverse. And that's where, especially in some emerging markets, I don't know if you've ever seen the, uh, you know, trillion dollar bills <laughs> that are worth nothing. Mm -hmm. um, we really just, you have to be really careful about the dollar's dominance, especially when you have um, so much of the commodity, like the oil markets really linked in dollar, you know, petrol dollars being in US dollars, like there's no guarantee in the future that that will be the same. Um, so I think it's just, to me, more of a trade and um, just be careful with, with currencies because it is uh it is really about interest rates in my opinion and also momentum perfect thank you so much you're you're making me want to go back to europe <laughs> <laughs> i love it i you know when the dollar was parity with europe i um you know i remember we went to canada and um i was like you know we should be going to europe why are we in canada <laughs> uh, i'm like you know i always love going to europe and so we uh we hopefully it will the dollar will remain strong this summer um, when the kids are out of school. Uh, I'd like to go make a trip back to Italy. Uh, yeah, great thinking, Clarence. I guess um, I need to load up on that because you look really amazing. Um, so I hope everyone sees this on YouTube. Uh, you got to see Nancy Davis, um, brilliant and beautiful. Uh, so it yeah. works well. <laughs> um, you know, I want to talk about my favorite. Well, I'm a fundamental analyst. Um, fundamentals are my thing. I love analyzing that for businesses and companies. And I was a CFO for, for many years for one of our businesses. And um, we know margins are compressed. They have been since for our business, our manufacturing business since the end of 21. Um, there's just that dilution of value. Uh, we're getting less output for, per input. Productivity's down. We have rise in the cost of labor, we already discussed, and debt and capital and production overall. Mm -hmm. um, so in my opinion, earnings um, should be further compressed. Um, and we could experience some type of two quarters back-to-back -back declining year over year, which they the definition is it's a definition for earnings recession mm -hmm. um what are you looking at in particular and what are your thoughts regarding that i know we don't have a crystal ball um but what are you thinking regarding all that please yeah i mean i think um multiples are very important too it's um it's definitely a, a tough time with whether we're going to have more you know, falling earnings, multiple compression, higher costs. Um, it's a, uh, it's, you know, I think, I think, again, being diversified is really important. It's, um, it's, it's tough because you don't want to say like get out of the equity markets completely because, mm -hmm. you know, most people want to have some exposure there, but it's definitely, you know, you could really see the case for things being tough but at the same time you know this is one of the most widely predicted recessions we've ever had you know everybody sort of is kind of in the camp that um we will have an earnings recession and so i think you're you're seeing that um that multiple compression but whether it's cheap whether it's expensive you know hard to know um but uh but that's again i think we're just being diversified. And in, in my opinion, like I'm more of a, a long-term investor, uh, you know, trying to think about asset allocation and diversification rather than trying to time it because it's pretty hard. I agree. I'm also a long-term investor. Um, and, you know, when you speak about diversification, agree completely, it reduces the business risk associated with just one or a few companies. Um, so, um, you know, we could talk about emerging leaders. Um, we are still in the bear market. And, you know, everyone always says how bear markets make make you the money. You know, this is when you buy, you know. And, you know, and real estate, because I've also been a real estate investor for many years, you know, you make your money when you buy. And I'm sure that's the same across all asset classes. So now is a good time to be identifying 
and looking at different companies and you know where we want to where we can maybe you know it involves speculation so we need to um, have certain criteria that we look for now what do you look for in companies or any particular criteria during this time period for what you think could be future leaders yeah i think um generally the way i approached starting my business um and how I think about companies is I like things that better client outcomes, right? Um, I think that's kind of like a great principle to say, like, does this, how does it improve, you know, people's lives, people's outcomes, whatever it is. Um, so that's kind of the way I approach it. Um, but I also think, you know, it's important to be diversified globally as well and have some exposure that's not just, you know, in our U.S. markets and really um, uh, taking a view that that is part of a diversified portfolio, you want to have different types of countries, exposures. Um, so I definitely look at it more, you know, outside of the U.S. more as a country level, not so much, you know, company by company. I think it's tough to be um, that that's a great place where ETFs can help or you know, managers who specialize in picking stocks, that's not me. Um, but the way I approach it is sort of, you know, things that I really think are transformational um, as individual investments, and then using more um, country indices or sector indices for equities. But that's, again, I'm not, not giving financial advice. Of I'm course. Not- my personal. That's it. To Thank you. You answered the, the question perfectly. That was just what your um, own way of looking at things, because we really value your opinion um, mm-hmm. regarding how you do things for yourself. So thank mm-hmm. you so much for sharing. Um, are, are there any sectors in particular, or if you could share with us any regions of the world or countries that you may have some interest in? Yeah, you know, I'm definitely um, very focused on multiple countries. I, uh, I'm i a little hesitant to give too much. Uh, I just don't want this to be, I'm not allowed to give, I'm not a financial advisor. Absolutely. But, uh, so I should probably stick more with the funds where I'm a portfolio manager for. So I'm not, you know, potentially giving any financial advice, which I am not <laughs> a financial mm-hmm. advisor. But um, yeah, I think I think the nice thing about, information and living in today's age is there's so much information available that you can really you know do your own research or consult with your financial advisor to figure out what's best for you and I think generally ETFs are really great vehicles because they're they're public fund wrappers or 1940 act funds and you can put a lot of different you know securities and types of investments inside of them so it's a nice way to get access whether it's to emerging markets or to other asset classes and so there's a lot out there for for people to research but i think you know definitely um definitely being diversified and not having uh you know too much concentration is important and i think real estate is one of those things like a lot of a lot of, you know, like I let me speak for my parents, you know, they don't own, you know, they're not Wall Street people. Like when I came to Goldman, they're like, where are you going? <laughs> you know, what's that? <laughs> um, uh, you know, um, and so a lot of people don't have um, stock and bond portfolios. They use their home or real estate investing for, for their wealth um, creation as well as savings. And so I just think it's really important coming into this new era of high inflation and higher interest rates to be also thinking about the real estate portion of your, you know, even if you're not a homeowner, say you're a renter, um, you do have exposure to inflation because your rents can increase with inflation. So I think going back to like why I think it's so important to have some kind of inflation exposure, it's because of um you know, sensitivity to to rates and interest uh, real estate and interest rates. Perfect. Thank you so much for mentioning real estate. I agree. And you know, you mentioned ETFs and I think they are the ideal vehicle for diversification. 
Um, and, you know, when I have discussions with people regarding, let's say, biotechs, you know, and that's a very high risk, high reward um, stocks in, in the biotech sector. Um, XBI is just an example, not buy recommendation, um, is, is, a, is a great way to play it for many because it diversifies you among many and you have less business risk specific to one company. Mm -hmm. So just as an example, um, that's exactly what you're saying regarding ETFs for countries, regions, um, different sectors, and, and especially rates. And I love the inflation protection uh, that you mentioned before. And the key that you said was those weren't around back in the 70s. <laughs> yeah. So when people- It sounds think, so obvious, right? When you say it, but I yeah. think a lot of people just don't think about it. You know, they think about what happened back then. And that's, I think, why you've had a lot of, you know, speculation <laughs> with inflation yeah. rising in those markets. Yes. And so when we think of the 70s and we see what worked then, like gold, and then we don't see that inflation protected, you know, rates and ETFs and inflation protected bond market or any of that worked. We assume that it's not going to work, but it actually wasn't around. Mm -hmm. So that's a very, very important point. And I thank you so much for, for mentioning that here um, about that. And emerging markets, uh, there are plenty of ETFs as well. Um, I think I agree with you. Um, you know, I've been reading um, a lot lately um, regarding different markets and um, they're saying, I mean, they always say that emerging markets, they say now India may be the next big uh, country to grow significantly. And so, um, and they said that Europe and US may be in stag stagnation <laughs> for quite some time. Uh, we don't know, we don't know the future, but um, the fact that you mentioned that the emerging markets, I agree completely with you. Um, I think it's important to diversify not only across sectors, but also across different asset classes, like you mentioned, real estate, inflation, uh, protected bonds, um, emerging markets. There's just so much out there. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much for mentioning all of that. Now I'm gonna ask you a simple question, maybe a silly question. Um, a lot of the traders, um, I guess on Twitter, are, are just traders overall are saying, S&P this year is definitely going to be positive because there has never been a time in history where the S&P was negative two years in a row. Do you believe in that kind of theory or do you think anything is possible? I mean, I guess I don't like words like never and always. Um, yes, me generally. Uh, so that's kind of something that uh, that I don't think are great ways to, you know, like look, a lot of, there are a lot of macro pundits out there that have very strong voices as well as opinions about what is going to happen in the future. I think it's pretty tough because even if you had a crystal ball into certain outcomes, like let's take Brexit, for instance, you know, nobody expected it, it happened, but the market reaction was almost like opposite day um, because people were positioning ahead of it and going to cash. And then when it actually happened, markets went down initially for a hot second and then back up. So I think it's really hard to predict the future. I think it's even harder to predict where markets are going to move if you knew the future. And so, um, I don't know, I, I'm, again, I'm not, I don't mean to discredit anyone's predictions, but I, I, I do think you always have to take it with a grain of salt because nobody really knows for certain, right? And, and even some of the best macro investors in the world, you know, they're right half of the time, which means the other half of the time they're wrong. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> That's why we need protection and diversification because we're not always right. Agree completely. Um, I, I love, I also agree that I don't like to use the words always, never, the absolutes. It's always uh, yeah. with a possibility because no one knows the future. Anything is possible. I mean, it's a what trillion dollar question to know the future, uh, to, 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 to have an answer to what can happen. Um, 
So agree as well. Um, Nancy, is there anything I miss that you'd like to tell us about or, or mention um, today regarding anything? I do want to know more about your services. That's for sure. <laughs> what your fund, um, the, the two ETFs, uh, they are on the New York Stock Exchange. And um, if there are anything else that you could tell us and how people could stay in touch with you as well. Well, um, we have our funds have websites which are pretty good for people to to learn about them. Um, it's a it's eyeball, not not eyeball. I see it fairly like whenever I say that. must be a Florida accent. I V O L E T F dot com, and then the other is B N D D E T F dot com. So those are probably the best places to go to to learn more about the funds, and then. You know, I uh, I did recently join Twitter, and I really appreciate connecting with you in the space. So it's uh, you know, I don't use that as often, but people can definitely reach out there as well as LinkedIn. Um, but happy to answer any questions. And for your viewers who are financial advisors or financial professionals, we also have some white papers, and you know, we did a piece on gold. Um, I'll have to send it to you afterwards about um, gold in the 70s and kind of uh, some analysis around uh, different different asset classes. And we try to just be educational. So I love that. I always love learning more. I think um, being traders, investors involved in any way with the market, we are mm -hmm. lifelong learners because the market gives us something new every day. <laughs> so we're always learning and adapting and hopefully improving. Um, upon yesterday. Um, you know, I definitely have very strong interest in both of those funds. So I'll be reading about them. I Vol, I V O L, and B N D D. Um, you know, I think it's so important to have protection, especially with all this uncertainty that we have. And I know we always have uncertainty, but it seems to be even more so nowadays. So it's important to have risk management and diversification is the key to risk management. I love that. Thank you so much, Nancy, for sharing your time with us. And it's no surprise you're not on Twitter all the time because I don't even know how you have the time to do all that you do already. Uh -huh. um, and then you have a family as well. So um, thank you so much. And I'm not surprised in any way that you're in the 100 most influential women in US finance. You Aww. certainly are thank a you. true <laughs> entrepreneur. Okay, a woman leader in business and finance. I admire you. And I think everyone needs to check out your quadratic capital and these amazing funds because it's very enlightening to know that we can have protection and in the form of an ETF. So thank you so much for meeting with me today and speaking. I had so much fun. I can't wait to see you again. Thank you so much for having me on. It was really an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to The Rose Show Podcast. Please visit rosannaprestia.com for more episodes. See you soon.